G'day, Richard Harris. I'm sorry, we're back in the classroom just briefly because I think it's really important to get your head around how constant mass flow valves work. Uh, for anyone who is diving a manual closed circuit rebreather, it's really important to understand the basis of how these valves work. Now the physics behind these things work probably requires a PhD to really understand comprehensively, um, but they are easy to understand in, in, in simple terms and I think it's really important to get your head around what, uh, what you're dealing with so that you don't start modifying things without understanding exactly what you're doing. So if you recall manual rebreathers, manual CCRs, work on the principle that a constant amount of gas is slowly leaking into the loop through the kiss valve um, and the, uh, the amount of oxygen that's being fed into the loop at any time is just slightly less than your basal metabolic requirement. So in other words, if I'm sitting here requiring 600 mils of oxygen per minute to just keep me alive and happy, then I would set up the rebreather so that it delivers just less than that, say 500 mils per minute, so that the PO2 inside the breathing loop will constantly be slowly declining. And therefore it's very important for me to be very vigilant and keep an eye on my displays, watch the PO2 at all times, and as required, intermittently, uh, dab the manual add valve for oxygen and add a little bit more oxygen into the loop to top it back up to the set point that I desire. And that is the fundamental basis of these rebreathers. And once you understand those basic principles, then manual rebreathers are very safe and, uh, and enjoyable to breathe. But underlying the whole thing is the principle, which is the, the interior of the, the kiss valve, which is based around this little orifice which has a, uh, an opening, an aperture, which might only be 0.003 of an inch in size. Now, let's try and get our heads around what's happening at that point. So on the upstream side of the orifice, um, we have P1, which is the pressure being supplied to the orifice. Now that pressure is set by the intermediate pressure of the regulator. Let's call it 10 bar, um, which is a simple number. Now on the other side of the orifice is P2, which is the ambient pressure. So if I activate a KISS valve on the surface here uh, with a regulator that has an intermediate pressure of 10 bar, the atmospheric pressure here, P2, is 1 bar. So the ratio of those two pressures will be 10 to 1. Now there's an important uh, number which we need to know and that is the ratio of P2 divided by P1, which needs to be less than or equal to 0.528. In other words, P1 needs to be just about double P2 for what's called sonic flow to occur. Now sonic flow means that the gas passing through that orifice will be actually moving at the speed of sound, 344 meters per second. And under those conditions, uh, essentially the system becomes very, very stable. If you increase P1 even further, the, um, the velocity of the gas flowing through the orifice will not change. If you start to increase P2, because we're diving deeper and the ambient pressure is increasing, remember one bar for every 10 metres approximately that we, that we dive down, then as long as the ratio doesn't change, then uh, sonic flow conditions will remain. And under those conditions of sonic flow, the number of molecules essentially passing through the orifice will remain the same with a few provisos. Now there's a very important proviso in setting up the system that we're describing. And that is that the regulator, the first stage regulator that's supplying the oxygen, supplying P1 if you like, has to be decompensated. Now do you recall that as you um, dive on a normal scuba regulator, you have a starting intermediate pressure of 10 bar, let's say, we go down to uh, 10 metres to uh, maintain the delivery of gas through the second stage oxygen, we still want a, an intermediate pressure of 10 bar. Now if we've now got an opposing force of an extra bar because of the 10 metres of water, then eventually we'll find as we go deeper and deeper that the, uh, the gas supply to us will be stifled and eventually stop. 
So what a normal regulator does, in fact, is adds um, by a compensating uh, mechanism, adds an extra bar to the intermediate pressure. So as we go from the surface, 10 bar intermediate pressure, down to 10 metres, an extra bar of depth, if you like, the regulator will compensate by increasing the intermediate pressure to, to 11 bar. So the, um, so the, the regulator is always working to, to supply gas uh, in an easy way to you. Unfortunately, if we have that sort of regulator in this system, P1 will increase at the same time as, as uh, P2 does. Now that sounds like a good idea, but the problem is in this system of sonic flow, um, increasing gas density on this side of the equation will actually increase the number of molecules of oxygen that are moving through the orifice. And so in effect, you will increase the uh, amount of oxygen being delivered. And that will continue as, as far down as we go. Eventually, the, um, the amount of oxygen being delivered through the uh, orifice will be overwhelming and you'll find the PO2 in the loop starts to uncontrollably increase. So a very dangerous situation. So the genius of the decompensated regulator that was um, you know, described by, by Gordon Smith and it, with his invention in the Kissery Breather was that this will constantly stay at 10 bar if that's what it set out. And although this will increase on the other side, as long as this ratio remains less than 0.5 to 8, sonic flow will continue, which means we have constant mass flow. The constant number of molecules of oxygen will be flowing into the rebreather loop and our, um, our metabolic requirements will remain happy and the PO2 won't spike. The downside, of course, is that when our um, ratio actually falls below 0.5 to 8, which will start to happen around 60 or 70 meters, because at that depth, we still have 10 bar here, but suddenly we have seven or eight bar on this side, then um, you know the ratio now has fallen um, uh, above 0.5 to 8, or has risen above 0.5 to 8, and the flow across the orifice will start to decline. And that will become noticeable in terms of the PO2 dropping more rapidly until we reach a point, which in this case will be 90 metres, where the opposing pressure will be exactly 10, same as the incoming pressure, gas flow will cease and we'll have no oxygen at all. Now that's embarrassing because you get to 100 metres and you've got to get back up to 60 or 70 metres to establish decent amount of oxygen flow before you can actually add more oxygen to the loop. And as you're ascending, your PO2 is going to be dropping. So please don't get caught out like that. Don't dive a manual rebreather past its uh, uh, depth limitation. Now you might say, well, why don't I just increase the intermediate pressure in the first stage regulator so that I can go deeper. Well, you can do that, but inter increasing that intermediate pressure will increase the gas density in, in terms of P1. Increased gas density on this side, although the orifice is fixed, and although you will be uh, at uh, sonic flow, a constant mass, mass flow, the gas density will mean that more oxygen is actually crossing the orifice and uh, therefore you may exceed that metabolic requirement that you've set the rebreather up for and you may therefore find that your PO2 instead of gradually declining is actually gradually increasing. Again, not something you want to do. It's actually quite hard to get rid of oxygen. You need to flush with diluent, for example, to be able to do that. The other thing you can do is change the size of the orifice and in a fixed system with a um, decompensated regulator like we're recommending, then if you are finding that actually you're a 900 mils per minute guy and you're only getting 600 mils through the orifice, you can either just increase your intermediate pressure a little bit to bump up the, the flow, um, or you can uh, put a bigger orifice in, which will deliver a, a larger amount. And the KISS orifices from memory come in about three different sizes, so you can play around with those a little bit. But around about 700 mils per minute seems to work for, uh, for a lot of divers, certainly it's people my size. So that in essence is the, the key understandings, I think. I'll, I'll show you some little demonstrations about what happens to flows when you increase intermediate pressure, uh, what happens if you use a variable orifice like a, um, like a needle valve instead of a fixed orifice, um, and uh, what can happen if you do decide to use a normal uh, compensated regulator 
in that case you have to definitely use some kind of variable orifice or have an ability to actually shut the oxygen off and have a bypass like a manual head system that still works uh, at those uh, greater depths. But deep diving on, on manual rebreathers is certainly not for the novice. It's uh, far more complex and ca carries significant extra hazards and you need to be extremely experienced before you go down that path. In front of you you can see the kiss valve with a filter, the intermediate pressure gauge and a low flow uh, flow meter which is going to measure the, the flow through the KISS valve and we'll be able to see what the intermediate pressure is. So I'm just going to pressurise the cylinder now just using air because none of this is really oxygen clean and we can see that the intermediate pressure of this regulator is sitting at about 10.5 bar and that's giving us a flow of just over 900 mils per minute. Because these orifices are so small it is possible for them to block off and that is one of the hazards of using manual rebreathers re and so it's important to do a test at the start of each dive to pressurize the circuit turn on make sure the oxygen is flowing through the kiss valve turn your cylinder off and then make sure the contents gauge of your cylinder does fall uh, relatively quickly so that you can definitely see that the kiss valve is patent and and working so I'm just going to turn that back on again. The next thing I'm going to do is start to wind up the intermediate pressure on the regulator. And what you immediately see is the intermediate pressure has gone up to about 12 and a half bar there. The flow has jumped up to nearly 1100 mils per minute. So that demonstrates the, the first principle that intermediate pressure increase with ambient pressure staying the same leads to an increase in gas density of P1 and therefore an increase of mass flow through the orifice even though the velocity or volume throw flow through the orifice is remaining stable. With a fixed orifice like this we can adjust via the intermediate pressure of the regulator the flow rate that best fits your metabolic rate. You need to sit on the couch breathing from the rebreather um, and uh, or, or at the bottom of the pool and uh, make sure that the PO2 in the loop is gradually de deteriorating, gradually declining. The other approach I want to demonstrate is the use of a needle valve in the system. In, instead of a fixed orifice, have a variable orifice that you can adjust on the fly. Now this needle valve normally has a nice knob on it like this but it's actually a bit broken but uh, good enough for this demonstration. So essentially I have a fixed intermediate pressure on the regulator but this regulator we're going to uh, pretend is actually normally compensated like a normal scuba regulator as you descend for each 10 meters that you descend it will add one atmosphere of pressure to the intermediate pressure in the regulator system. So at the surface we've got it set to just over 10 bar, at 10 metres the intermediate pressure will increase to 11 bar. Now the effect of that is to increase density of the gas passing through the needle valve or the orifice and the effect of that will actually be to increase the constant mass flow thereby increasing the amount or number of molecules of oxygen that will be delivered into the system and that's potentially dangerous as we descend. And unlike the a decompensated regulator that we showed in the first example this will actually um, continue to increase the the uh, mass delivery of oxygen into the system as we continue to descend so um, by operating a, a needle valve as we descend you can actually start to decrease the velocity or flow of oxygen through the system I'm sorry this is a bit hard to adjust because it's a little bit broken but what you'll start to see as I close the needle valve is that the the flow rate of oxygen will decrease now remembering that the pressure side of the equation in P1 is still increasing uh, by one bar every 10 meters the density of the gas will still be increasing and by winding down the velocity or the volume flow rate that we're actually measuring here will still be um, delivering sufficient oxygen into the system. Now this um, is certainly a more advanced form of manual rebreather diving and I would not embark on this until you have an, a very significant experience with the 
normal uh, fixed intermediate pressure fixed orifice system um, but the problem is that is depth limited and so if we want to dive deeper then the 60 70 or 80 meters that uh, those those cmf valves will allow and we still want to use a manual system then this is one of the approaches that we can use to uh, continually add oxygen into the loop beyond those depths and as i say it's only one of a couple of different ways you can approach that problem but it is quite effective and uh, when we first started doing this there was a guy in australia called tubby mckenzie and uh, two other guys chris law and uh, John Delazuana, who actually invented their own version of this very system. So this is basically a KISS valve. It has a, a needle valve, which is adjustable, and a manual add valve for adding squirts of oxygen. And this has been brazed together from a, a clipard valve and, a, and a, um, I think a, a swage lock valve. And uh, these guys in around about 1999-2000 successfully dived their modified Dolphin semi-closed rebreathers, turned them into closed circuit rebreathers and dived them using these valves to about 85 metres out in Bass Strait on a wreck called the Bayonet. So um, very forward thinking and it was actually this device that first got me into rebreathers and started my fascination with the whole process. So good on those guys. The last thing I want to show you is another version of a KISS valve. This is a fixed orifice. Uh, the gas is flowing in through the oxygen port here. This one's actually for diluent and you can use this as a manual add valve for, for diluent and there's a common outlet for these two gases uh, just here and in this case I have this flowing to the, the flow meter. So this orifice at uh, 10 and a half bar intermediate pressure is currently set up for about 700 mils per minute which is actually perfect for, for me for my use and um, of course this is the manual add valve for oxygen if I press that it's going to blast the a uh, little ball up to the top of the, the flow meter, so I won't do that. And like the original KISS valve, uh, this is uh, a fixed orifice and that flow rate can only be adjusted by adjusting the intermediate pressure of the, of the, uh, of the regulator, which I can demonstrate here. So if we increase the intermediate pressure, we'll increase the, the flow rate. So yeah, just another version of another KISS valve. This one is a, a dual manual add valve. Uh, for both diluent and oxygen, as well as having an orifice, a kiss valve, if you like, inside. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense, and I haven't confused you totally. Uh, it is a, a, a bit of a tricky topic to get your head around. There's some really good articles online, of course. Uh, one on the Revo uh, site, uh, Paul Raymakers wrote a nice little article about constant mass flow. And so there's plenty of stuff there, but there's also lots of physics if you want to get into it. And apologies to anyone brainier than me if I've made any fundamental errors. See you next time.